In the last tutorial, we expanded on our signal generator module and examined the mixing of various kinds of signals. In this tutorial, we will shift gears and learn about one of the fundamental digital signal processing principles called correlation. We will examine the utility of correlation, the implementation in software, and the application of correlation to the problem of filtering. Webster's Dictionary defines correlation as the mutual relation of two or more things. In our application, correlation asks the question, how alike are these two signals? Numerically, the result of asking this question results in a number between minus 1 and 1. The answer is 1 if the signals are exactly the same, minus 1 if the signals are opposites, and somewhere in between when somewhere in between. Let's start out with a simple example. Here I have written two signal generators. These generators produce arrays which contain a waveform. We will use correlation to compare the two signals. There are two important characteristics we should observe. First, the correlation of the two signals is always zero except when the waveforms have the same frequency. So if I run my simulation, I have two signals that have the same frequency and the correlation down here dot dot o is non-zero. If I change the frequency of one of them we'll see that the output of dot o goes to zero for every frequency except the one where they are exactly the same. The second characteristic of correlation is that when the frequencies are the same, the correlation is a simple function of the phase of the signals. If the signals are in phase, the value is 1. If the signals are exactly out of phase, the value is minus 1. We can see this as we change the phase of the signals in our sample circuit. As I move the phase back and forth, You'll see the phase moving here, and you'll see the correlation moving up and down. Let's take a look at how we actually perform the correlation of these two signals. Correlation is measured using a mathematical operation called the dot product. Now, the dot product is a very simple operation. Take each element in one array, I have an array A and array B. Take each element in one array, multiply it by the same element in the second array, and add them all together. So here's my program that does it. For every value of n inside these two arrays, mul multiply an array element from A and an array element from B, and add them up. This is such a common operation that DSP Explorer provides a built-in operation, also called dot, which does the calculation. So we can either write this for loop right here and do the computation ourselves, or we can use the internal function provided by DSP Explorer. This runs about 30 times faster than this, which is why it's provided as a built-in, and I usually use the built-in. As we have seen, the correlation of two signals is easily calculated, and that the output is zero except when the frequencies are the same. This leads one to consider that correlation might be used as a filter technology, and that intuition is exactly right. In our initial examination, we compared two arrays which were constant, but this need not be the case. We could make one of the arrays contain variable data. And I've done this in our next example. Here, I've used our signal generator, and I've made up an array of values from the signal generator using a shift register that is 128 samples long. And I'm going to compare or correlate that with my signal generated here, which is also 128 long. 
Now we need only compare this shift register value to this reference signal. And when we run this, we'll see the familiar waveforms. Here's my input signal, here's my reference, and here's my output signal. Again, if we change the frequency of our reference, we will see that the output will be zero for frequencies different than the reference. We now have a signal generator frequency of 5. This frequency is 4. You can see it's different here from here, and the output is 0. Take special note here. As we change the phase of the reference signal, the phase of the output signal will also change. Let's change this back to 4. Run it. Here's our waveform. As I change the phase of this reference signal, our output, ref our output signal will change with it. This is a very important characteristic of correlation and we will exploit it in our future tutorials. So in effect, we have used correlation to implement a filter. It provides an output only when the two frequencies are the same. However, this is only because every frequency we have used has been carefully chosen to be harmonically related. Of course, this does not happen in the real world. What happens if the frequencies are not nice and well-behaved and harmonically related? We can explore this by using our signal generator module to scan a range of frequencies and watch the output in the frequency domain. Let's move to the next sample circuit. Here I'm going to sweep the frequencies from 1 to 20. I'm going to provide a single frequency as the reference. Here's my shift register to record the values. Here's my dot product to do the correlation. And let's go ahead and run it. We can see here as the frequency gets close to this, this frequency gets close to this, the output gets bigger or smaller. And down here we're looking at the frequency domain, and I'm scanning pretty fast so it's a little ragged. It will clean up here in a moment. As we can see, the circuit does provide a filter function. Unfortunately, the stop band is really quite poor. The scale from here to here is 40, from here to here is 40, so or maybe 12 or 15 dB of stop band. This poor performance is due to a phenomena called spectral leakage. We will deal with spectral leakage in a future tutorial dealing with a DSP technique called windowing. In the meantime, there is more to be learned here. We have managed to create a filter which is quite narrow. We would like to see how we might make it wider. The easy way to make the filter wider would be to simply provide multiple references, perform multiple correlations, and sum the output. We would have this circuit. Here I have two references, do two correlations, add the two together. And if I run this, look closely at the three spectra shown. The green, the green one is the spectrum of dot zero, the black one is the spectrum of dot, and the red spectrum is the sum of the two. So here we have the green one. Here we have a black one, and here's our red one, which is the sum of the two. Yes, we have doubled the bandwidth of the signal, but we've also doubled the amount of computation we need. Fortunately, like many other DSP functions, correlation is a linear operation, and linear operations, I believe, are always associative. This means that the addition can take place before the actual correlation and we can see the result of this in circuit correlation 5. Here 
we've got two reference signals. We add the arrays together and do a single correlation. We let this run for a while and fill in, and we will indeed see that the outputs are the same. This is a very important result. It means that we can make filters of any bandwidth simply by computing a reference and performing a single correlation between our incoming signal and the reference. Indeed, in correlation 6, we see just such a filter. Here, I've written a new function which generates a reference which has all the, all the frequencies between the lower and the upper. So I, here I've made it only too wide, just like our earlier example, and this output will be familiar. Make the scale the same, the signal will look the same. So, the outputs look the same. If we change the upper and lower bands, we can widen the filter. Here we have a much wider filter. We can make it wider still. In this tutorial, we introduced the principle of correlation. We examined how correlation could be used to compare signals, and we wrote the code to perform this comparison. We then used this simple code to implement a very narrow filter. We then showed how the filter could be made wider by adding multiple correlation functions. Recognizing this approach would be compute intensive, we then showed how the computation could be reordered. This allowed us to build filters of an arbitrary width without affecting the computation required. In the next tutorial, we will examine this class of filters from a different perspective, and we will explore how to improve their filtering performance.